Hello, I am Claire Falani, and I play Mrs. Winthrop in Disney's Black Beauty. I'm excited to read one of the finalist stories in the high school category for the Wild Beauty Foundation's inaugural creative writing contest with the theme of wild horses. The story is called Anna Stampede and it was written by a 15 year old Lauren H from Golden, Colorado. Anna Stampede. According to my elders, I was born a year after the sky hoarded its waterfalls and the fertile soil turned to dust. While human children listen to legends of dashing chivalrous heroes or fables with wise morals, I grew up on stories murmured through the dry mouths of the curmudgeonly old horses who had gone through the gnawing episode of having nothing to eat or drink. They whispered to me tales of warning of having to resort to eating sagebrush instead of grass, which made them sick, and droughts that cracked the ground. I didn't pay much attention to them. I was only concerned with filling my own spoiled stomach. I got tired of my mother telling me whenever we grazed upon the golden grass. You are so lucky, Anna. You don't know what desperation is truly like until you see what you love teetering off the cliff of life and death. I hate to admit that my mother was correct, but not because of my pride. I didn't realize that she was correct until the day I knew that I would never see her again. It was the twilight of summertime, what humans call September, when the sun is stolen away by the clouds, the color of smoke and ash. I was a filly of just a little more than two years, living with my herd of eight other horses, but we lived in such close proximity to other herds that an outsider might mistake us all as one large group. We were content with our lives. It rained enough for us to be comfortable. And, and although the vegetation was nothing close to verdant and bountiful, all the grass that we needed to survive grew in healthy amounts. On the fateful morning that changed my life forever, I was expecting nothing. I was woken up rather mundanely by my mother who played, batted her hooves upon my back. She was in an unusually good mood. Wake up, Anna, she explained, exclaimed. How about no, I muttered, still half asleep. We have to migrate quite a bit today, remember? New watering hole. At that statement, I reluctantly got up. There was no time to waste. The watering hole we had been using for the past few days was too small and it was drying up quickly. And if other herds got to the new watering hole before we could, then we would risk going thirsty for a few days. The sun was still rising when our herd drew towards the dewy Petricher emanating from the south. We didn't encounter any horses from other herds as we cantered through the shallow canyons, which I thought was odd. When we were relocating ourselves, we hardly ever went a day without encountering at least a lone horse, if not an entire herd seeking the same goal we were. Water. Where are the other herds? I asked my father as we were slowing down for a walk to catch our breath. I don't know. Looks like all their noses aren't working today, he said, snorting. Better luck for us for once. Suddenly, a high-pitched, unfamiliar whine echoed from behind her, from behind me. Oh, at last, I thought, turning around to see. Looks like their noses do work after all. However, the sight that met my eyes baffled me. Scores of horses spill down the edge of a small hill, just around 50 metres away from us. I felt in my own body the agitated drumbeats of hundreds of hooves vibrating through the ground. They galloped in a panicked max mass, as if a pack of all the most horrible creatures in the world were chasing them down. What is this? My mother murmured. The other horses of our herd took a few uncertain steps back, and then I saw it a floating vessel with gyro gyrating blades attached to the top, slicing through the wind so swiftly. 
The air must have died from all the lacerations. It suffered from the spinning edges. We stood shocked and unable to fully comprehend the alien aircraft hovering just behind the fleeing herds, pushing them towards us. My father gathered his senses first. He took off hollering, go! The rest of our herd bolted after him. Well, everyone except me. I was still paralyzed in place, too overcome with fear to move. The strange vision of a building, wave of stampeding animals, reduced to their primordial beings by terror and the deafening thwip, thwip, thwip of the revolving knives turned my limbs to stone. All I could do was stare into the unfeeling eyes of my imminent annihilation. Anna, I could barely hear my mother's call. She galloped back to me, nudging me. What are you doing? Go, she shouted. Her voice switched my mind back on. And just at that unfortunate moment, my brain processed that the stampeding crowd was only meters away from me. Whatever gears within my legs screeched back to life. And before I knew it, I was among them, galloping on and on. I couldn't see where we were going or distinguish any individual. Forward, go forward was the only thought we had the wit for. Then it all unexpectedly stopped. My nose bumped into the side of another horse as it suddenly halted, digging its hooves into the ground. I tried to turn around to see where I was, but there were too many of us, crammed together like a jigsaw puzzle, that it didn't quite fit together. I glanced towards the sky and I saw to my relief that the flying metal entity was going in the other direction. However, the fright that had controlled me just seconds ago possessed me once again when I realized that none of the horses within close proximity were of my family. Mama, Papa, I yelled, but it was of no use. I wasn't the only one calling for the members of their herd. The whinies and the neighs and the too many turned into one cacophonous nightmare. The dust kicked up all of, all of the running swirled in our faces. The sweltering heat didn't help me cool off either. It was too much. I stopped trying. I closed my eyes, wishing everything would just go away. Over time, I felt less hide throbbing against me and the vocals of horses were gradually replaced by something else, a foreign voice. I don't know how much time had passed, 30 minutes, an hour, perhaps a day, when something cold suddenly gripped my face and I opened my eyes, surprised and irritated. Not a horse, but a human. I realized that their hand, I realized I had their hand on me twisted away from the human and they backed away from me in alarm. What are humans doing here, I wonder? My eyes drank in the situation. My eyes drank in what the situation was now. Approximately half of the horses were all crammed with me and were gone now. And we were all in a strange enclosure with wire fences that only the strongest, most powerful horses could possibly leap over. There was more than just one human. In fact, humans outnumbered horses now. Anna, Anna, I heard a familiar voice laced with distress coming from somewhere behind me. I turned to see my mother lying on her side. One of her back legs was twisted at an ugly angle. A certain red liquid leaked onto the ground beside her. My heart crawled into my throat as I rushed over to her side. Are you okay? W what happened? I stammered. Anna, listen to me, she said hoarsely. During the stampede, I fell and I broke my leg. The humans found me lying on the ground and they brought me here to examine me. And then they left me. And I watched them look at all the other horses and do things to them. Anna, they're somehow putting horses to sleep. They're putting the elderly, sick and injured horses to sleep with strange needles. I tried to wake them up, Anna, but they didn't wake up. Listen to the humans, Anna. 
They say that they are doing this because there are too many of us. They say that there isn't enough water to support us. They mean to... I don't know what. Anna, look at me. Something bad is going to come out of this. I want you to jump over that fence now and run. Run as if you were on your own stampede. But it's too high. Now, Anna, I love you. Please, do it. You're strong, Anna. I know you can do it. I wanted to ask her about her broken leg and how she's going to heal, how she's going to find me, but the steely look in her eyes shut my mouth. I glanced back at her one last time before I faced the metal fence. It was too tall, unconquerable, but I reared up anyway, propelling my legs into the air because my mother believed in me. I heard some distinct human shouts as the bottom of my stomach grazed the sharp metal. And then my front hooves hit the ground and I was galloping, galloping away from that peculiar, awful place. Oh, how good it felt to run alone without a hundred other grimy horses racing across the land next to you. The bloody cut on my hide didn't bother me in the slightest. Eventually, after running for a few glorious minutes, I got tired and I remembered my thirst. That watering hole and the purpose of the day that had brought me through these events. I followed the comforting damp smell and I was delighted when I found that welcoming watering hole. And I was even more pleased to see that I had it all to myself. And as I drank from that water, I noticed my strange reflection. My grey coat was crusty with dirt, but the single white star on my forehead was still somehow miraculously untouched. My mother had the same star on her forehead. We were the only horses with star on our forehead in all the herds of these lands. How is she going to join me? I didn't wake up. This was my mother's voice in my head as I went upstairs. I didn't wake up. I didn't wake up. When I was tearing across the golden grass, hurtling towards that cliff of life and death my mother had warned me about so long ago. <sighs> Anna Stampede, what a beautiful story. Congratulations, Lauren, for writing such a magnificent piece. And thank you for using your creativity to help protect wild horses. I'm Claire Falani, and I stand with wild horses. Thank you.